Amen, amen. Take your Bible, turn to John, if you would. And, and uh, I want everybody to say hi to our visitors back here. This is uh, Will and Wyatt. Earp. Will and Wyatt. They come by today, and uh, we've had a good talk, Will and I, in our office. And Wyatt has eaten a lot of my candy, but that's all right. What is there for? John chapter 17, and uh, you pray for them. And uh, I think, I don't believe in accidents, I don't believe in mistakes. I think things happen for a reason. I think. I think the wind blew Will and Wyatt over this way for maybe just for tonight. Who knows? But uh, it's good to have them with us. I've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, Will is a former serviceman. He served in the Marines. Or not not the Marines, the Army. You're not a jarhead, are you? No. And um, so I tell you what, I appreciate those who serve their country. And anytime I see somebody wearing an Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine cap or whatever it is i go thank them and tell them thank you for the i had one guy i went up to he didn't have any kind of hat at all he didn't have any jacket he didn't have some insignia on his jacket or anything like that he was, he was an older fella and i just walked up to him and i walked up kind of behind him and i i got his attention i said sir and he turned around and he looked at me and i said uh did you did you happen to have you did you serve your country and he looked at me and he said, yes, I did. He said, I was in Korea. He said, how did you know? And I went, he still had the haircut from 1951, still had the same haircut. And he got a kick out of that. He really did. So uh, I appreciate those who serve. I really do. And uh, I want you to make Will and Wyatt feel at home tonight. <clears throat> John chapter 17. Uh, let's go. Uh, tell you what, let's read this. And uh, this just verse 12 here for tonight. Uh, or let's see here. Where do I want to go? Let's start with verse 12 and I'll read down a few verses and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, John 17 verse 12. While I was with them in the world. Then, then remember, th this is Jesus praying to his heavenly father. He's praying to God and he is praying for his disciples and not just the 12 men that we refer to as the 12 apostles. He's praying for all of his disciples, past, present, future. He's praying for all of them. And, uh, and, and listen to what he says. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, and it's interesting that he says it this way. He says it as if it's already been a past event. Remember, this is Christ before Calvary. Right before Calvary. And he prays this knowing that he's about to go to the cross. And so he is telling his heavenly father, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And, and what is that? That's the name of God. You, he is the Lord. He is God. He is uh, in Hebrew. He's uh, Adonai Elohim uh, El um, he is Jehovah. He is um, the Prince of Peace. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, and so on and so on. The everlasting Father. Uh, I've kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. Keep in mind, no one ever is saved unless God saves them. God bring it was God that brought you to Calvary. It was God that brought you to the cross. And he said, and none of them, watch this now, none of them is lost. But there's one exception. And we'll have a little discussion about this here in a little bit. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition. Underline that, make a note of that, because we're going to talk about that in a minute. That the scripture might be fulfilled now think about it what the the fact that he chose judas is who he's obviously referring to he's not referring to peter as the son of perdition 
Perdition is, think of it, think of it like this. Perdition is hell. It means destruction, destroy. And there's heaven. We are children of heaven. The, uh, Paul said in Galatians that Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Mary's not our mother. The church is not our mother. Jerusalem above. So we have two men. We have the son of God, <clears throat> the son of heaven. And we have the son of perdition. Total opposites. That the scripture might be fulfilled. And he said, now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word. Amen to that. Do you believe God gave you his word? The Bible that you hold in your hand tonight is the word of God. It has zero mistakes in it. It has been translated correctly. There's not anything that can be added to it, nor should anything be taken away from it. God has given us his word and he has reserved that word and preserved that word. Um, anyway, he said, uh, I've given them thy word and the world hath hated them. I can tell you stories tonight of just how much the world hates you, hates me, hates our church, hates our ministry, hates um, the work that we do in Kenya, hates it, jealous of it. Just like they hated Christ because he was preaching salvation, being free. And here all the religious people, whether they were the people of the Roman Empire or the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they kept people in bondage and did not want anybody to be free. Because they are not, they've hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Now remember what I just said. That the son of perdition is born of perdition, born of hell. And that's interesting because the beast rises up literally up out of hell, out of the pit. You and I are born from heaven. We are, we are not of this world. And I'm going to expound on that tonight uh, as we get a time to do that. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here. Thank you, Lord, for a nice, nice day today, cool day. We thank you, Lord, for the rain, and we thank you, God, for bringing all of us together. And we pray, dear God, that we could be a blessing one to another. We could be a blessing to those, Lord, that are joining with us online, those that are watching this message, uh, maybe a day after it's posted, a year after it's posted. Somebody comes by this and they want to listen to it and they're blessed by it. That's my prayer, Father. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just unite us together in your love. Keep us humble, Lord. Keep us on our knees praying. Father, we understand that we have very, very fierce enemies. Uh, Lord, we have all the devils that hate us and that are against us. But as Elisha pointed out to Gehazi, his servant, they that are with us are more than they that are with them. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for that. We ask, God, that you watch over us now and keep us in your good, gentle care. Uh, Father, we pray, dear God, that uh, you would send angels to watch over us tonight. Just bless your word and bless your people in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. That phrase, son of perdition. It's only found one other place in the Bible. Naturally, I want you to go there. That'd be 2 Thessalonians. Turn there in your Bible. Even though it's on the screen, I want you to turn in your Bible. It'll be the same Bible, same translation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Y'all pray for my voice. It's still not, still not healed up from the weekend. All that preaching and everything. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Christ mentioned the son of perdition, something that's always intrigued me is that 
it looks like the Antichrist, the beast, the son of perdition, the man of sin, it looks like to me that at one time he poses as a born-again Christian. That's what it looks like. Let me, let's read this. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, so we know that it, it's a reference to a future event, and by our gathering together unto him, that was, that's what we would call the rapture, the translation, being caught up together, the resurrection, first resurrection, that you be not soon shaken in mind. There's a shaking that's going to take place. God said that he's going to shake both the heavens and the earth. John saw that when the sixth seal was open, that the heavens were shaken and the angels fell from heaven like figs from a fig tree. So he's telling us in reference, I believe, to that event that we be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Troubled is a word linked in with tribulation. Tribulation and trouble usually go together, especially in the Bible. Neither by spirit. How many of you ever been troubled by a spirit? Raise your hand. I have. Uh, others have. And I'll tell you what, spirits can be troubling, troubling things. Uh, let me tell you a little theory. I was talking to somebody about this uh, over the weekend. Um... It's known scientifically that we have, a, we have a set of nerves that come right down from our brain and they go from our brain, they don't go down the spinal column, they're separate from that and they are connected to our heart, our lungs, our stomach and our bowels and when we are feeling extreme emotions, and it could be good emotions, like, uh, you know, the first time a, a young man takes the hand of a pretty young lady, and they're holding hands for the first time, and all of a sudden hearts are bumping, and people are breathing, and there's nervousness going on, and they feel gooey in their stomach, okay? Uh, or the opposite of that, extreme fear, uh, terror. Um, what he said here, things that are troubling to us. Um, some people suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and it's a real thing. And it has a lot to do with things that they've encountered or things that they've endured. Uh, I've made it no secret to people that I just, I do not like electric wires, electricity. I don't like static electricity in the wintertime. I am always walking around discharging electrons from my body by using the back of my hand up against metal corner beads in a building. You see me walk around, I'm touching corner beads with the back of my hand because that's where I feel them the least. I'm discharging. I don't like that feeling of just reaching out and touching something and getting that shock. I don't like thunderstorms like I used to. I used to love thunderstorms. Sit and watch them all the, all the time. I don't like lightning. I don't like anything like that. And it, it has caused me at times uh, to, to run, literally to run. And I was just amazed at that, that, that that came out of me like that. But that happens. You get troubled. And what happens is the vagus nerve reacts to those emotions. And it's what causes us to breathe heavily. It's what causes our heart to pound, our stomach to be in knots, our bowels. Sometimes sometimes you will lose your bowel content over this. And <clears throat> my point in this is this. It is known that tigers have a growl that is so low in frequency that it, in most cases, it's not audible to our ears, 
but it still has an effect on humans and other animals. When that tiger growls, it's with a very, very low tone. Huh? What is it called? I don't know what... I... Okay. Yeah, well, I couldn't hear the word you were saying. Okay, I'll have you spell it later. But anyway, that's what it does. And all of a sudden, our, we, our, our heart starts pumping, we start breathing heavily. We kind of get maybe a sick feeling in our stomach and whoa, you know. And I believe in the spirit realm, see a, a tiger is nothing more than a lion with stripes on it. It's what it is. It's part of the big cat family. And there's lions in the Bible. And I believe that spirits have the ability to strike fear into our hearts without really us knowing their presence, knowing that they're around. They have the ability to strike fear into us. And that fear may induce what's called the fight or flight syndrome. And that's a real thing too. Uh, I've seen these funny videos where some guy dresses up like a bush. You seen those? And as people walk by, he jumps at them like that. And there's two reactions. Some people start running. Or some people turn around and whack, deck the guy. Okay. And uh, it's kind of funny, but it's an instantaneous reaction. It's not something that they ponder and think about. It's not something they dwell on. Boom, it just happens, okay? Well, in the case of spirits, I believe they have that ability to strike fear into us at certain times. And how we react to that is how we will be trained to react to that. You see, they train people that are going to be police officers. Nowadays, they really, really spend a lot of time because of the unrest that exists in our country. They are teaching more and more police officers how to turn down a situation a few notches, how to calm people down so that two parties don't get excited and a cop ends up doing something that he shouldn't do. We have that going on. Warfare, things like that can induce that. So I believe that there are devils out there that can strike fear into us. And that, that notice what he says here in verse 2. That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither, neither by spirit. Don't let a spirit trouble you into running. If you're going to get troubled and it's from a spirit, Turn around and fight. Amen? Neither by spirit, nor by word. Things that people say to us. Hey, things that, we're, things that we read on, on social media can strike fear into us. Can turn us to where we are afraid of what could happen. Neither by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That means you, you've decided the Bible's right and everybody else is wrong. And that's how you don't get deceived anymore. Somebody says some kind of goofy thing, you read the Bible. The Bible will tell you the truth. God cannot lie. So, uh, and he said, let no man deceive you by any means. <clears throat> For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed. And here it is, the son of perdition. So now here's the... $46 question. Is Judas the Antichrist? Now, I don't have an answer to that. But is Judas... I, I will say this. He is an Antichrist for sure. Because the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. John told us that. That's revealed to us in the scriptures, so we know it's already there. You, you can see it through the Old Testament. You can see it in Christ's days. Of course, Judas. Uh, but there are some 
who have taken the position because of what the Bible says. There's only two people in the whole Bible called the son of perdition. One of them's Judas. The other one is the man of sin, the son of perdition. And he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. Now, I, I, would, I could make a case against Judas being the Antichrist because I don't really see Judas trying to take over the leadership of the disciples. We don't see that. We don't see a, 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 a tug of war going on uh, between Christ and Judas Iscariot. What, everything that Judas does is in secret. The Bible tells us that he was a thief because he carried the bag. What does that mean? Is that whatever money was given to the disciples by, by people and so on for their support, for their living, Judas took care of it but he was skimming off the top. He was taking money and stealing it, all right? So he was a thief, and he also betrayed the Lord. We know that he was money hungry because it just took 30 pieces of silver for him to sell his soul, okay? What a price, amen? You want me to sell my soul? You better come up with a whole lot bigger. You better come up with something a whole lot better than eternal life in heaven, amen? So is he the Antichrist? Now just, just let you raise your hand and say, I think Judas is because of this, or I don't think he is. I think he's just a type of an Antichrist figure. Yes, Steve. Say that again. Satan himself entered into him uh, right before, uh, well, as he left the Last Supper. So Satan physically entered into him and uh, basically took him over. Okay? So you think he's a type? Yes? Not bad. Not bad. Okay? Well... I'd, I would say that, and I'm just playing, oh, I don't want to say I'm the devil's advocate. <laughs> Let's just say I'm an adverse opinion. Um, the Antichrist comes from somewhere, does he not? Does he not have a, does, did he not at one time receive a deadly wound? in his head, and that wound was healed. Um, does he not come from the pit? Well, how did he get in the pit? So there's a lot of questions there. Uh, Judas, on the other hand, uh, is the opposite of Christ. He's hanging from a tree voluntarily. He hung himself and curses anyone who hangs from a tree. Simultaneously, you have the Son of God. What's he doing? Hanging from a tree. Okay? So anyway, I, yeah, I, and I, I don't think that Judas is. Just so you know my opinion, I don't think that he is. But, I would say, study Judas' life. Study what the Bible says about him. Get to know, get, become familiar with it. So that you have an understanding Maybe God will show you a little bit of something about the Antichrist coming in the last days. But anyway, uh, the Bible says he opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Psalm 109, turn there. At, and, I'm, and I'm pointing this part out specifically because of what Jesus said concerning the son of perdition. He said, um, oh, let's see here. Yeah, verse 12 in John 17. Uh, I have kept them in my name, or in thy name, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. What scripture 
it needs to be fulfilled. Well, one of them, I believe, is Psalm 109. Um, Psalm 109 is a prophecy concerning Judas Iscariot. Now, let me add this to that, which is where I was going a while ago. It, it seems to me that whoever the Antichrist is, he appears as one of us. And I took that phrase from uh, the movie, um, huh? No, not the omen. Um, Isaac Asimov, the iRobot. Because remember, Will Smith is looking for this one robot and this who is smarter than the rest of them, and he goes and hides in the bunch of robots that are waiting to be released. And Will Smith asks, hey, where's the robot I'm looking for? And all the robots say, one of us. One of us. We know that there is going to be another Jesus. We know there's going to be another gospel. We know there's going to be another spirit. We know that the phrase anti-Christ literally means the opposite of Christ, against Christ, not the Christ, but the other guy. And we know from Jude that certain men crept in unawares that are not part of who we are. We know that John said concerning people that left the flock, John said they uh, were not of us who left, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, but they were not, they left because they were not really one of us. If they had really been saved and truly born again, they wouldn't have left. But they leave showing you that they're not really, they're not there. They didn't make it. And so anyway, we have a prophecy here, Psalm 109 verse 4. For my love, they are my adversaries. Listen to what he's saying here. I loved them. I gave them my love. I died for them. And because of that, they become my enemies. You ever had that happen before? Love somebody, care for somebody, do things for somebody, and they just, now you're their enemy. And you, you don't know what you did. You may not have done anything. Um, I've got people that are still alive that have hated me since I was about 15 years old. I'm not kidding you. Uh, but anyway, for my love, they are my adversaries. But I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good. What did Judas do? He rewarded Christ evil for good. And hatred for my love. And here Judas comes to seal the deal with a kiss. Set thou a wicked man over him. So who entered into Judas? Satan himself. Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. Well, there it is. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. Now... Understand that Jesus knows this. Does Jesus know this scripture when he's picking Judas out? Sure, he said it. He wrote it, okay? So to me, there's no question whatsoever <clears throat> that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he picked Judas and why he picked Judas. Some would say that Jesus picked him and he was saved and born again because he was one of them, but... Then he turned bad. And people will use that same argument concerning um, like the creation of the devil. They cannot handle the fact that God creates bad angels. But he creates them for a purpose. Did he not grow the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Did he not create that tree? Yes, he did. And he made it sin. Don't eat of the fruit of that tree. He did it on purpose. 
Did God make Lucifer knowing that he would turn out bad? Absolutely. Why? To show his power, to show his ability to save us, to give us power over our enemies, and to show us that we have a choice. You really can choose between God or the devil. Which one would you rather have? Which one would you rather have a thousand years from now? Amen. So, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned. He's already condemned. And let his prayer become sin. Boy, I tell you what. All of these wacky uh, ways that people are praying now. Contemplative prayer. The whispering prayer. The Jesus prayer. Um, Lectio Divina, which is... Uh, part of the Jesuits and their training is that they are very, very, very well trained in uh, what is referred to as occult meditation. And Pope Francis, being a Jesuit, this has already been stated publicly that he still practices the spiritual exercises given, handed down to him as a Jesuit by... Um, uh, Ignatius de Loyola, who created the Jesuit order. And it is said that Pope Francis begins his day every day in that kind of meditation where he empties his mind and his mind becomes a void. And then he hears a voice from inside of him speaking to him and he is told that that's God's voice. But it's not. Can't be. Amen? Can't be. So, his prayer literally becomes sin. Let his days be few and let, here it is, here's the prophecy, let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Now, we're not, we're not told anything about Judas having a wife or having children. We're not told anything of that in the scripture. But that's the prophecy. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. In other words, his bloodline ends. And there is no living offspring of Judas Iscariot on this earth anywhere. Okay? So, that's the at least one of the scriptures that, uh, uh, that Jesus is referring to or, or that Paul is referring to. So that scripture can be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, uh, back at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I should have told you to keep your place there. 2 Thessalonians 2. Verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Notice the capital W. That's, his, that's a name. Um, I'll give you, something to, give you something to study that you'll like. Uh, the book of Psalms and Proverbs speak often of the wicked. The wicked. Or a wicked man. Or things like that. But look up, look up the word wicked you could and i i'm assuming wickedness might be in there as well let me see here bible search software let's try this out sweep it with the besom of destruction you ain't heard me say that in a long time have you wicked wickedly wickedness so we could look at all of those and if we were to go to the psalms Job would be a good place to go to as well. Uh, for thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. That's Psalm 5. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. The wicked, I believe here in, in Psalm 7, 9. The wicked. In verse 11. God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. So it would apply to two groups. Number one, 
all people in the world who refuse to follow God and walk in the ways of sin, they are the wicked. But it also, I believe, refers to a singular person. And it could, re, it could involve a singular person in a generic form, just any one person, or it refers specifically to the man of sin, the son of perdition. He is the wicked. God is angry with the wicked every day. Um, and so you could have, let's see, that's uh, 494 occurrences in your Bible. Have fun. You will. I pro listen, I promise, if you set aside some time and just look at every verse in the Bible where the word wicked, uh, wickedness, um, what other forms were there? Wicked, wi wickedingly, <laughs> okay, I made that up just in case you didn't know. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, you, I, that would be a good, good, good study for you to do to fill your time, okay? Till the next time Matlock comes on or something like that you want to watch. Uh, but anyway, he said, and then in 2 Thessalonians 2, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the spirit of his mouth in reference to? Huh? Wait, 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 wait. Let's read the verse again. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Ah, oh, there you go. You woke up. Yeah, because if you look in Revelation 19, what's coming out of his mouth? A sharp two-edged sword. What is that? It's the Bible. It's the word of God. So how can you beat an antichrist spirit? Or with the Bible. These young college students that go and protest anti-abortion laws and they have some of the most vile things written on their shirts about God, vile things about serving Satan, um, just evil, pure evil. They have the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, they have that spirit in them. Uh, people who are atheists. Most atheists are very, very angry people. They hate God, which is all, which I don't see how they can. How can you hate something that does not exist? Mm -hmm. I hate boiled ice cream. And no such thing as boiled ice cream. So you can't hate it. All right? Um, so it's not possible. Anyway, they're very angry people. They hate God and they hate you for believing in God. Bill Nye, the science guy, is a very, very unhappy soul. Okay? And all you have to do is watch him. He was invited to go with Ken Ham through the, uh, the ARC experience. And Bill Nye, the science guy, I mean, you saw his mean character coming out of him. I just watched it for a little while and I had enough of it. Okay? But anyway, that's, that's who these people are. Uh... He shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That means the light. Turn the light on. Devils don't like light. Cockroaches don't like light. Amen. So when you turn the light on, certain things flee. And you turn the light on in your life, these things will be gone. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. We had that part with Judas because Satan entered into him with all power and signs and lying wonders. Uh, I didn't get to do that during the homecoming, uh, but I, I, was, I still am collecting all kinds of little video clips and things like that to show you signs and lying wonders that 
infatuate people and they grab their attention and they make people think that these that they have some power with God or that they have some force uh, that lies in them that allows them to do magic things or whatever. And I'm telling you, it's in some cases, it's parlor tricks, pure and simple. It can be easily discerned. Uh, but in some cases, there is an actual devil involved in that. And it's not any power that they have on their own. Your brain, your mind does not have the power to bend a spoon. And they still talk about Yuri. Who's ever heard of Yuri Geller? Okay. He made, he made big noise, Sister Betty, in, in the 70s and 80s because he would go around and just touch spoons and bend them over. And he would, he would do that on, on television with people all around him. And uh, they set up, he was going to go on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and he was going to he was going to bend spoons on television. Carson, who used to be a magician, called James Randi, who busts people like uh, Uri Geller and so on, and said, how can I get him on television? He said, don't let him or any of his people near the props that you're going to put on the stage. So Carson's people put spoons and they put keys and all these things that Geller is famous for being able to supposedly bend with his mind. And they put them on a little table there in, in front of him. And he comes out on stage and he's sitting there and he's looking at that table and he doesn't see his props on it. And he says, one of the first things he says when he comes out, he says, oh, this is kind of scary a little bit. He don't see his props on there because his props are pre-bent. They're at that point to where they're just about ready to go. And there was actually one TV show where uh, I think it was done in uh, Sweden or something like that. And they brought out this all kinds of stuff for him to bend. And lo and behold, there's a ladle, like an aluminum ladle sitting on the table. And Geller says, oh, I, I'll just I'll just I'll just use this one. And some a stagehand offers him. Another one, a different ladle. Here, bend this one. No, uh, this will be fine. And when you get a close-up, you can see it's already got a crack on it. And all he does is just rub it a few times and peek, falls off. And he makes people think that he can bend things with his mind. And people still regard him as some great psychic. He's a charlatan. Lying signs and wonders. But see, that's what attracts people. That's what gets them. And pulls them away from the gospel. And with all deceivable and of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Revelation 13, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And that would be, I would say, power to deceive the entire world. Power over the people. We're studying powers on Sunday morning in the messages and understanding what powers are like. But he basically gives him the power to rule over every man, woman, and child on this earth. And no one will stand against him. No one will, no one will want to. That's the kicker. No one will want to stand against him. How did Hitler gain the power that he had? The people of Germany willingly gave it to him. The first nation that he invaded was Austria. And Austria just said, come on in. Not a bullet was fired in Austria and Hitler just took it over. It says mine. And they fell for it because they gave him their power to rule over him.